Hello, I'm Karen Stathopoulos, and today I'm going to be reading some writing by MFK Fisher, who is one of my very favorite writers. And my husband Kim Krauss and I just recently returned from Aix-en-Provence. And the reason I say this is that the whole reason that we ever went to Aix-en-Provence in the first place in 1998 is because of MFK Fisher. Now, before I read you a little of her writing, I have to explain how I came to have this very deep, passionate relationship with MFK Fisher. So bear with me. It starts strangely. When I was like 13 or 14, I was at the age where I would put my hair in curlers after I washed it. And mom had this kind of old fashioned dryer that you sat under a hood. And the thing is you had to sit under that hood for like 20 or 25 minutes before your hair was dried. So I love to read, so I needed something to read. And we had recently been given by my aunt the Time Life version a book called The Cooking of Provincial France. So I don't know exactly why I glommed onto this, but the minute I started reading it, it was just like, it just called to me. So I just kept reading it. And every single time, so once a week for many, many years, when I sat under that dryer drying my hair, I would pull out The Cooking of Provincial France by Time Life and just read. I just loved it. When I get to the end, I started again. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of what it just is probably explains why I'm so enamored of France, French people. And here's a little bit of it. The kitchens of provincial France, the more or less typical family meals cooked in them, the Sunday afternoons at home or out, all suggest an especially French set of feelings about cooking and eating. French ways with food and drink are not exactly the same as other people's ways, and some of the differences are worth learning about. At the least, they help explain what makes the French so French. An example is that their main meal is at noon, when few American families are together. For another, there are more courses in this meal than some American or English women would encourage or even condone. The French change plates much oftener. They abhor mixing distinctly different flavors, and since they do like variety, with one dish enhancing another, of necessity, the plates must be changed meticulously between them, even in very simple households. Neither silver nor plates used for fish, for instance, are used again for meat, vegetable, or salad. French people want and expect, if they can manage it financially, one meal a day that will interest and amuse them, past the acceptance of plain nutrition. They do not consider a one or two course meal to be a real meal. Once a day, they want to sit down to a correctly served repast and believe, for reasons unfathomable and perhaps even ridiculous to many other cultures, that a good main dish should be preceded by that small something called an hors d'oeuvre. Even if a man is very poor, he will still expect for the noon meal that his wife prepares, she manages to scrape together for him a nicely hard-boiled egg, perhaps to be shared with her, peeled and cut in two and decorated with a dusting of fresh pepper and maybe cucumber. Then he will put down his goblet or tumbler, his knife and fork, and wait with pleasure for the important part of the meal, the hot dish, savory with herbs, no matter what they are rescuing, artfully contrived, no matter how inexpensively. He would be offended, shocked, to come directly from his work to that delicious dish, or to sit down to a steak and baked potatoes after a couple of scotches and a bowl of salted cashew nuts. So anyways... That just gives you a little idea of that, but I love this book, and so there it was Mums and Trilla. Meanwhile, another thing throughout my life is because I love food and cooking, you often come across quotes by like people who love food, Julia Child, James Baird, and always in those quotes, I would see MFK Fisher listed after a quote. I had no idea who MFK Fisher was, and I didn't even try to find out. But one day, much, much later, I found a book in a secondhand shop that was by MFK Fisher, and I said, okay, let me buy this book and see what this is all about. So I discovered that MFK Fisher is Mary Frances Kennedy Fisher, who was born in 1908 in California. She died in 1992. So that book was Sister Age. I loved that book. The writing was sublime. She talks about her relationships with various older people in her life, what they meant to her, what they taught her. Anyways, I loved her. So, 
Then I was like, okay, I know who this MFK Fisher is. A little bit after this, my mother, who knew that I loved this book, found a secondhand one for me and gave it to me for Christmas, whatever. So there I was, you know, many, many years after my teens going, oh, I love this writing. Wow, this is so fun. I love this book. And for the first time, I looked to see who wrote these words. And of course, it was M.F.E. Fisher. I shrieked. I, uh, my mother could not even stand me. She was like, oh my God, oh my God, what do you mean it's M.F.K. Fisher? I said, no wonder I love this book. I love her. So I asked for all her books for Christmas. I think I have all of them. And now you are wondering what this has to do with Aix-en-Provence. Well, M.F.K. Fisher wrote a book called Two Towns in Provence. The two towns are Aix-en-Provence and Marseille. She makes you feel like you want to be right there with her. It's just I don't know. That is why we went there in the first place. And I'm going to read you a little bit, which is just, it's hard to even give you the full flavor, but it describes X, which I've just returned from. So this is MFK Fisher. So here's the town, founded more than 2,000 years ago by the brash Roman invaders on much older ruins, which still stick up their stones and artifacts. Countless poems have been written in wine rather than acid, and countless pictures have been painted about the healing waters and the ever-flowing fountains of the place. They will continue as long does man, and the delicate iron balconies will cling to the rose-yellow walls, and if anyone else from 200 BC to now ever marked the same places on his personal map, in wine or even tears, his reasons would not be mine. That is why X is what it is. Main Street, the Cour. The Cour Mirabeau is the main street of Aix-en-Provence. It is less than half a mile long, some 120 feet wide. It is bordered on either side by a double row of plane trees. The Cour has teased poets and painters with its ineffable allure for more than 300 years, but words and lines and colors do not capture the reasons why it is beautiful and not pretty, why it is serene and not soothing and dignified yet gladsome all the year, even in the stripped austerity of winter. It is probable that almost every traveler who has ever passed through X has been moved in some positive way by the view from one end of the core to the other, by the sounds of its fountains in the early hours, by the melodious play of the pure, clear sunlight of Provence through the summer cave of its leaves. It is a man-made miracle, perhaps indescribable, compounded of stone and water and trees, and to the fortunate, it is one of the world's chosen spots for their own sentient growth. Myself, for two years, I crossed it many times a day and sat under its trees and walked up and down it on both sides, alone with my children, now and then with friends, in sunlight, moonlight, rain, fog, and every time it was the first time. And I felt a kind of prickling under my skin and a tightening in my chest and belly and a kind of dazzling in my head and a generally excited, stimulated, moved sensation like, like being in love. The street was made in 1651 after Marie de Medici brought from Italy to France the aristocratic pleasure of taking the air in public. The delight of strolling the length of the Cour Mirabeau at any time in every season has never ceased to charm and almost to hypnotize whomever once sets foot on its majestic length and width. It was built on the location of the ancient ramparts, which in one form or another has shielded the original town for almost 2,000 years. Some exois say that a river flowed past these ramparts. Others say that the core covers the bed of an old canal. Whatever the reason, deep waters and long, thirsty roots are why, everyone believes, the double rows of plantains on either side of the street have reached so high and have withstood so long the ravages of wind and drought and gradual pollution. The plane trees which now thrive along the Cour Mirabeau help make it what has often been called 
the most beautiful main street in the world. There are still four fountains the length of the Cour, just as at its beginning. Compared to the other fountains of Aix, La Rotonde is melodramatic, overstated, brassy, a trumpet call with flutes. The first sight of it, though, when a traveler approaches from Marseille, is exciting. In daylight, La Rotonde tosses out its many plumes and jets of water like the breath of a hundred spirited horses. At night, it glows with white and colored lights, which turn it into a kind of glorified wedding cake, audible if inedible. Four jouts, four jets spout from these figures' pedestal into a wide basin from which many more mouths send out their waters. Far below, an even wider basin catches them and eat bronze cherubim, astride frolicking dolphins send out double streams of water that curve like low rainbows and blow past the rim of the great bowl. It is, in truth, a monument to 19th century romanticism, and perhaps it escapes vulgarity simply by being an ex. Certainly, it is curiously satisfying, full of life and joy. It acts as a kind of noisy but melodious introduction to the other fountains of the street, which stretches eastway, er, eastward from it. At the opposite end, always called the head of the corps, stands the fine statue of the good King René, which has lent its serenity since about 1820. Everywhere in X, water flows musically below the king's statue into the generous basin, and people fill their pitchers from its cool jets all day long, or perch on its wide brim to gaze about them tranquilly. Traffic flows around the handsome king who made Aix known throughout Europe as a center of learning and beauty. Westward from René, about 300 feet, is Old Mossmac, which steams like a theatrically inverted cauldron into which the cold air of winter flows. Old people still dip their aching hands in its warmth, and many others drink its water sparingly, to take the cure for various human troubles. It has a faint but harsh smell, and it is one of those strange fountains of Provence which consist of a great lump of live stone on which thick lichens grow, with the water flowing up to the top and then down over the mosses. These monuments can become grotesque, but old mossback is merely comfortable to look at, like an elderly and benevolent dog a little steamy and pungent. Further down, toward the Rotonde, is the Fountain of St. Lazarus, which is also thought to be healing and which is now the most popular on the core for drinking water. People come for blocks at noon and before supper to fill their pitchers from the graceful curves of its basin. It is known by everybody as the Nine Cannons. And then the core ends after its harmony of light and color and sound and line in the almost rollicking vigor, vigor of La Rotonde. It is exciting after the cool green cave of the street in summer under the leaves, and then in winter, the muted rose and yellow shadows on the old facades to step into the penetrating brightness, never blinding, of its unshaded monument to the three arts. It is like being a fish up from the sweet depths to the surface for a different kind of air. Traffic flows around and around the great crossroads, but the sound of all the jets of water rises above it and seems to drift always eastward toward the nine cannons and old mossback to the feet of tranquil King René. X, as you might imagine, has been called the city of fountains and music and the two are synonymous with it. Summers, during the festival, the whole town quivers to the sounds in the open air of cloisters and courtyards of violins and flutes and voices, and above them always rises the indescribable, soft, steady music from at least 14 public fountains and uncounted, at least 40, murmuring basins hidden in gardens and inner courts. Each quarter in X has its main public fountain, to which it is unquestioningly loyal. It is always the clearest, purest, most beneficent water to its users. 
in this or that particular source, which springs up through the subterrane as though a miraculous filter. Here, warm and fumy, there, icy sweet. When I lived on the Rue Cardinal, I was caught between two loyalties. For at the east end of the old quiet street spouted the wall fountain in front of the church St. John of Malta, perhaps a hundred feet from my attic room. And further to the west, there stood the beautiful basin and statue of the four dolphins. The four dolphins is its, the antithesis of St. John's basin. It is elegant and in perfect balance with the small square of fine townhouses that frame it. It sound steals away down the four streets that spin out from it, and in summer, generous chestnut trees bend toward it. Four of the merriest dolphins ever carved by man spout into the graceful basin under its stone needle, topped by a stone pine cone. And it seems unlikely that anyone pass can pass by this exquisite hole without feeling reassured in some firm way. So when Kim and I first went in 1998, we obviously went to Aix-en-Provence and we had to stay on the Rue Cardinal because that is where MFK Fisher lived. So fortunately, there's a Hotel Cardinal. We stayed in a room right outside the church of St. John of Malta. And I'm just going to read you a couple of postcards that I wrote to my mom and dad. Let's see, this first one is 2002 October. Bonjour, mom and dad. Kim and I are sitting on a bench under the plane trees on the Cour Mirabeau, listening to a gypsy violinist across the way. It's been blue skies and lovely weather since we arrived. The first day, we lunched on salade niçoise and rosé at Les Deux Garçons, then dinner at La Brocherie. We are in our same room last time. We wake up every morning to the ancient church right outside our window with the matins chiming. Tomorrow we take our first road trip in the Peugeot. You would love X. Love and big hugs, Karen and Kim. Two days later, I wrote them again, because you can't have enough postcards. Bonjour, mes chers mom and dad. Yesterday, we went on our first adventure in our rental Peugeot. Then we dressed to the nines and dined at Les Deux Garçons on my birthday. I had oysters on the half shell and sole meunier, and we drank a crisp Provençal rosé. The weather is très belle. The 12th century church outside our windows is wonderful. We love its chimes. One more 12 years later, also in October. This is when our anniversary is, so we tend to go in October. We've been seven times to X. Cher mom and dad, bonjour. Today is our 28th anniversary. We're sitting on a bench on the Cour Mirabeau. <laughs> you can't get too much of that, really. Watching the people go by, we changed from our morning outfits that we went to the big street market in because the afternoons are much warmer. We have reservations at our favorite Bistro Latte for tonight. Our apartment is elegant and spacious on the lovely Rue Frédéric Mistral. Every morning, Kim goes to buy a loaf of pain à l'ancienne that we rip apart and slather with butter and confiture griotte, which is this wonderful jam they have there made of sour cherries. We have good strong coffee and yogurt too. X is just as cute as we remember it. I wish we could whisk you here so you could have breakfast with us. You can see the faint lettering on the building where Cezanne's father had a hat shop. Hat shop. Cezanne lived in Aix-en-Provence. Okay, now let's see. Close to the end here, another little clump of my a journal that I wrote in 2012 when we were in X. Just a little snip. It's that lovely, almost dusk time in X. The sun is hitting just the top floor of the yellow building at the end of our street. We've undergone a wild weather change from nearly 80 degrees and sunny to less than 50 with a fierce mistral. Now the mistral is this exciting wind that can come any time in Provence, which is particularly thrilling in the winter, it happens when there's rain up north in France, and it is really, really fierce. Many things are called the Mistral. We have our windows closed for the first time we've been here, and the heaters are on. Woo. All right, now I'm just going to read you one last thing from another book that I love. This has five of M.F.K. Fisher's books in it. Yes, I'm impossible about M.F.K. Fisher. But since I can't read you, I, I can't really explain why she's so wonderful. I've read you descriptions of X, but this explains somewhat what she writes about. 
This is MFK. People ask me, why do you write about food and eating and drinking? Why don't you write about the struggle for power and security and about love the way others do? They ask it accusingly as if I were somehow gross, unfaithful to the honor of my craft. The easiest answer is to say that, like most other humans, I am hungry. But there is more than that. It seems to me that our three basic needs for food and security and love are so mixed and mingled and entwined that we cannot straightly think of one without the others. So it happens that when I write of hunger, I am really writing about love and the hunger for it and the warmth and the love of it and the hunger for warmth and then the warmth and richness and fine reality of hunger satisfied and it is all one. I tell about myself and how I eat bread on a lasting hillside or drank red wine in a room now blown to bits and it happens without my willing that I am telling too about the people with me and there are other deeper needs for love and happiness. There's food in the bowl, and more often than not, because of what honesty I have, there is nourishment in the heart to feed the wilder, more insistent hungers. We must eat. If, in the face of that dread fact, we can find other nourishment and tolerance and compassion for it, we'll be no less full of human dignity. There is a communion of more than our bodies when bread is broken and wine is drunk. And that is my answer when people ask me, why do you write about hunger and not wars or love?